Oh, Russ here, very TV. Welcome. Check out this beautiful December day. We got a special treat. We're gonna go meet a really good friend of mine. Most people don't know about him. We're gonna make it right here on Moon Mountain Road. We're heading up to uh, north part of uh, Quartzite. In a residential area, just past this restaurant here. This is uh, West Quail Trail. Then we're gonna go up here a couple blocks, make a left. Yeah, I got an email about a week ago from this gentleman. He is one of a kind, big heart, and he helps veterans. His name's Gunny. And a few years back, he established this Gunny's Military Museum right here on his own property. It's open to the public. He just built this new building here on the left. So get ready. We're going to meet Gunny and get our own RV or TV tour of his museum like right now. Hi everybody. I'm Gunny St. Germain. Welcome to Gunny's Military Museum. I'm here year round in beautiful Quartzsite, Arizona, less than a mile off I-10, exit 17 or 19. It's easy to find me. You can either ask someone in town or you can go things to do in Quartzsite. I'm listed on there and it'll give you the route straight out to the museum. Been doing this for a while, 13 years here in Quartzsite. This year it's all Marine Corps. I started 1904 with the uniforms on the mannequins going up to present day. I'd like to honor all Marines. I honor all veterans. This display will be up for approximately two years and then I'll switch over to Army Air Corps, Air Force and Space Force. Every year and a half to two years I like changing it up. I don't want to miss anybody. I want to honor all our vets. So if you'd like to come in, take a quick peek at a couple of uniforms, I'll show you right in here. Good. This year's display, I start with a Marine Corps special dress, full dress uniform. What's unique about this uniform has a couple things. One, this was for NCOs and privates, but they weren't issued. You actually had to go over to the base if you had an event to go to, check it out, do the event, and then when you were done, return it to the base. So that's why very few of these actually have names in them because they weren't issued to the NCOs or privates. And what really makes this unique, this is the only Marine Corps uniform cover that has a quadrifoil on top. It's the only one. The officers have the quadrifoils, this is the only enlisted cover that has a quadrifoil. This uniform was worn by the NCOs and privates from 1904 through 1912. After 1912, it was strictly for band members. So that gives you an idea. I love doing the research. This gentleman here, here's his information. His name's written in the trousers, Herman Losh. And I like to do the research on all the names I can find associated with the uniforms. That way, I, people, when they look at it now, they read about the individual, and it makes it personal for them. Kind of like if you do a shadow box, put a picture of the vet in there. It makes a whole world of difference. Then we jump into World War I. We have the dress blues. And we have the service uniform. This gentleman here, Lester Francis Ransom, he uh, from Philly area, Philly, Pennsylvania. And all that is original, came from uh, his estate. A friend of mine picked it up in New Jersey. 
And then we come to the female uniforms. A lot of people forget that we got women veterans. Now, I can't honor men veterans and not honor the women veterans. It wouldn't be right. Plus, my number one goal having the museum and the displays is to educate people. It's to honor the veterans, educate the families, educate people who just want to know about it. Uh, the research on the uniforms and the individuals is what makes it very special to be able to come out here and do this. 90% of my uniforms are original. There are some, the reversible camis from World War II, those are a reproduction. Uh, unfortunately, this is done by donations and out of my pocket. And when we start getting into the expensive gear, I just don't go out and run out and buy something. My pride and joy of this display is my Navajo Code Talkers. I did this to honor our Code Talkers. I knew Samuel Holliday. I'd met him several times, got to talk with him, and what an amazing Marine. He's a true American hero. You'll read that no Code Talkers, Navajo Code Talkers, were ever taken prisoner by the Japanese. But Samuel Holliday, was taken prisoner twice by the American troops who thought he looked Japanese. Just an amazing individual. We lost Sam a couple years ago, and there, we're losing our code talkers so fast. There's only one or two left of the original code talkers. So it's just a tradition to carry on and to educate. Got the radio, everything that he would have used over there on display here. Then we go in a couple more World War II Marine Corps to dress blues. If you notice the ribbons on here, are they're called half-inch ribbons. They're wider than what the ribbons are today. The Marine Corps started with those in the early 1900s, and they officially stopped using them in 1959. Again, a female uniform. This was actually worn by Bertha Giffels, still working on some research on her. If you notice, they even had a purse cover to match the uniform. And the nicest thing about the old uniforms, as you can see right there, Bertha's got her name tag in there. She put the name tag on her purse, it's in her cover, it's in her jacket, and her skirt. So that really helps researching an individual. Then you'll see some replica weaponry up there that were used through the different wars by the military. Of course, if you're going to do a Marine display, you got to have a Navy corpsman there. Now, Running Jen was one amazing individual. Reason I say that, he was a corpsman in World War II. Got out. Korean War broke out. He joined back up. Not too many people did that, but this gentleman did. He might be Navy, but he was Doc to us, and that's who takes care of us. This is a display of what Doc would have had, the general display of what was in there. Everything in there is original, with the exception of the emergency medical tags. I found those in France. <laughs> Go a few more to Korean uniforms, and if you notice this female service uniform, she has the small chevrons on her jacket. But in World War II, the same uniform, they had the larger, the men's, because they didn't have them made yet for the women's. 19, early 1950s, they went, they changed a lot of the uh, female uniforms, and that's what it evolved into. Then we go Korea khaki uniform. The Korean War veteran is the toughest one to show in there because all the M53 gear came out, they didn't get. So they scraped, scrounged, borrowed, stole, whatever they could find to try to stay warm. Not everybody could stay warm. So they had a mixed bag of uniforms while in combat in Korea. Then we got a female uniform. The seersucker is what they called us. And if you notice in her chevrons, there's no cross rifles. So that actually dates this uniform 
prior to 19, say, 64. In 1959, the Marines changed the uniform regulations and they added the cross rifles into the chevrons. And they brought back Lance Corporal also. So, but you had up until 1964 to actually upgrade to the new chevrons. So, we know she was in prior to 1959, but I can't tell you when she got out. And of course, everybody knows about Camp Lejeune. If you go there, don't drink the water. One of the things that will always stay up in my museum on display is my POWMIA table and my POWMIA display case. That's something that no matter what services I put in, if it's Navy or Air Force or Army, this display will always be here to honor those who never came home. I got some things like a Claymore uh, practice, uh, anti-personnel mine. It's got everything in the bag. I love showing the kids that because they get the biggest kick out of the little ingenuity of things. Then we jump into the Vietnam area. A couple of Marines here. This was uh, Chief Warrant Officer 4 from. He spent his time in Vietnam, and then when he retired, he was actually a CWO4. Some of the unique things is how he carries the watch. A lot of my uniforms, when I display them, I have veterans come in that actually served, wore these uniforms, and they'll say, hey, this is how we wore our watch. So it, I like doing from the photographs of actually being used compared to what the book says. So I display how they were used. This is the old M61 belt. There, they're getting few and far between. Then we have the Ertl camels from the Vietnam era. Then we go to the officer's evening dress. This was David Brian Prue. He retired a major, and he was a, actually a graduate of the class of 60, 1960. Went to Vietnam. Uh, I'm still working on as many medals and stuff to display. And then the one Marine uniform that puts the fear of God in you and everybody sees it and then they start laughing, the old drill instructor. That's one of the fun ones I have that I deal with. Going to Chief Warrant Officer John Stafford. He was a CWO4. He donated this uniform from his uh, closet when he retired. I proudly keep that on display. Then the females had the white dress uniform. Uh, this one's basically 1968 when it was made. And they wore these up until October of 2000, so they no longer wear that white uniform. And of course, I spent my career in the Marine Corps on CH-53 helicopters. This is uh, my setup for a 53 helicopter. The name tag was donated by a friend of mine from the Marine Corps, Don Kaufman, with his combat air crew on there from Vietnam. And that's what a crew chief would wear when he's out climbing on that 53 flying around. Then we got the service uniform for the officers. And basically, if you look at the Eagle Globe and Anchors, you can tell an officer Chevron has the rope coming off the anchor where an enlisted one will be on the anchor. So that's an easy way to tell an officer and enlisted when it comes to EGAs. Got my field desk set up, Vietnam era. Uh, I got the field phone, got a Prick 10 radio over there. And I keep this out because there's nothing funnier than when a young child comes in and asks their mom and dad, what this is. And then you try to explain to them it's bonus. They say, well, how do you text? Where's the picture come out? So it's a good conversation started with the youngins. We have a uh, 1990s uh, female staff sergeant set of blues, still working on tracking down who this uniform actually belonged to. Then we jump over into Operation Restore Hope back in uh, 92, 93. These were two of my uniforms I actually wore over in Restore Hope. We had the, what we called is the chocolate chip. 
and then we had the uh, desert camouflage pattern three color. Then we jump up. Uh, in the Marine Corps, you grow up calling all warrant officers gunner, but there's only one true gunner. When you're selected for it, which is a very hard thing to get selected for, you automatically become a chief warrant officer too. And then you take over as that. Very hard to get. I believe you have to have an E7 or above just to qualify for that. Then this uniform is dedicated to Brian Wilson. Brian was a young Marine who lost his life over in Iraq. And so I honor him. I even got his little log book with his photographs. He left behind a young wife and a young baby. Uh, anytime I do a uniform like this, like the Code Talkers, I actually ask the families, I send them photographs of it, ask families for their permission to be able to show it. And I got blessings on that and the Code Talkers. Then as you can see on the tables, I have an assortment of everything from patches to shooting badges, Eagle Globe and Anchors through the ages, a little Iwo Jima sand on there, got to have that. And then I collect the female and the male chevrons through the ages. I have some of them on display. All my pull chains for my lights are dog tags. <laughs> I just don't put none of the modern ones up that have the social security number on it. And if we come over here, I got some interesting pieces. More of the female chevrons. Then the Marines, uh, post-Korea War, actually wore the wide metal chevrons on their collars. That's a collection of them. They did away with those in 1959 when the cross rifles came out. Here's an interesting piece that wasn't a Marine Corps issue, but you would buy this, and they actually advertised it in Leatherneck. This was the stencil kit for putting your ring on the herringbone uniform. And you could do all the rings on that. Jungle first aid kit from World War II, complete. The uh, two and a half gallon water bladder and carrier. It's, we all just laugh and call that a giant canteen. Of course, I got my K bar. Those were issued during World War II in Vietnam, Korea. Uh, a lot of them are given out now as retirement gifts and things like that. We got the, the Marine Corps enlisted ranks from 1959 up to present day with the black that go on your collar. Interesting one here is the uh, Marine Corps Warrant Officer Insignia. Started back in 43 to 54. You had two ones and in 1954 to present, you got the other five. And this is some of the half inch ribbons I was telling you about on the dress blue uniform. These were the size that the Marine Corps and the Navy and the Coast Guard used. The Army and then the Air Force, they had the smaller ones that everybody wears today. I like putting things up around. I've got the uh, mess dress chevrons up there, some posters. I have an assortment of covers through the time period. And it's just, it's an honor and a privilege to be able to do this to honor our veterans, to educate people. Uh, and the one last thing I want to show you is over here. I put this here because I think it's hilarious. The smudge pot. Now I'll ask a Marine that comes in to visit the museum what we use that for. And I actually had a couple of them says because we build roads. I said, no. Nah. I said, old school rifle range that's how you smudged your sights so you wouldn't be getting no glare off of them. So if you're ever in court site, feel free. Uh, we'll have a cup of coffee. We'll shoot the breeze. If we cross some of the same dirt, knew some of the same people, come on out, visit. It's a blast. Love to have you out here. I keep a uh, guest log here. I have everybody signed. I get an average a little over 3,000 visitors a year. And I love it here. I can't think of a better way to spend my retirement. So thank you all. I'm located at 735 West Ocotillo Lane. 
Now the tough part about that, sometimes it don't come up on GPS, I don't exist. So like I said, go to th uh, Things to Do in Courtside, Arizona. You'll see Gunny's Military Museum. Just follow that and come on up. Thank you all. I've enjoyed this. I hope you have too. Tuesday through Saturday, 9 a.m. to 4 p.m., get out here. Meet Gunny. Support this military museum right here in Quartzsite. Unbelievable. He puts a name to every uniform. It makes it personal. I've seen museums all over the country. And this is a very special one. While I was out here filming him, I spent a few hours out here and he had helped. We had to stop so he could help different veterans fill out paperwork. That other little trailer there is his office. One lady just lost her husband. He was helping her uh, with his final services, all military, other veterans come out. Unbelievable. Very, very cool. Once again, this is 735 West Ocotillo in Quartzsite, just off Moon Mountain. Just past uh, that Quail Trail restaurant. You'll find it. Look for the flags, look for Gunny. <laughs> Unbelievable. Journey continues. Talk soon.